بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so this hat that I'm wearing on my head is actually a very, very special hat to me. The story behind it is when I first came to Medina, I had like a whole bunch of like multicolored hats, like those African style hats. I had one that was green, one that was like, you know, uh, an aquamarine and a black and like a baby blue and a white. And everywhere I'd go, I'd stick out like a sore thumb. Until one day, the te- one of the teachers tells me, he's like, look, you got to change the kufi that you're wearing. It just looks too awkward. So I went out and I bought two kufis. And subhanAllah, you know, as life went on, you know, four or five years went by, who knows what happened with the kufis. Um, but this past weekend, I was visiting my parents, and I cleaned out my room, and lo and behold, I found the original two kufis. And subhanAllah, I was like going down memory lane, and it's interesting enough, it's going to tie into this hadith over here that we're taking today, because, you know, part of these kufis, they were a part of the, the journey of struggling while in Medina, and part of the journey of even before going to Medina, subhanAllah. So inshallah, we have a couple of interesting stories uh, about my rebellious days coming up, inshallah. So let's start off with the first hadith uh, that we'll be taking tonight, with the night It's hadith number 21. عن أبي عمر وقيل وقيل أبي عمرة سفيان بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال قلت يا رسول الله قل لي في الإسلام قولا لا أسأل عنه أحدا غيرك قال قل آمنت بالله فاستقم on the authority of Abu Amr, and it is said also Abu Amr, Sufyan bin Abdullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, who said, O Messenger of Allah, tell me a statement about Islam, such that I will not have to ask anyone other than you. He answered, say, I believe in Allah, and then stand firm and steadfast to that. This hadith was recorded in Muslim. This hadith was recorded in Muslim. This hadith was also recorded by other than Imam Muslim, and it actually has an addition to it. And that addition is after Sufyan bin Abdullah asked him this question, he asked him a following question. He went on to say, Ya Rasulullah, ma akhwafu ma takhafu alayya, fa akhadha bilisani nafsihi thumma qal hadha. Sufyan then said, O Messenger of Allah, what is the thing that you fear most for me? He sallallahu alayhi wa then took a hold of his tongue and said, This. And this is the end of the complete narration. Now when you look at this narration again, you'll see the trend in the past couple of hadith that we've taken, that they're very, very short hadith. Very, very short hadith. Here he simply just tells him, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ فَاسْتَقِمْ Let's say, I believe in Allah, and seek to be upright after that. And again, here you learn you know, the eloquence of the Arabic language. And I think the easiest way to explain this in a modern day context is like the usage of Twitter. So Twitter only allows you to use 140 characters, right? In those 140 characters in the English language, you can only, you can barely say, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Right? That's pretty much 140 characters over there. Or you say, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. That's like 140 characters right there. In the Arabic language, I've seen like certain mashaykh write like a whole essay in those 140 characters. And that's due to the deep meanings that the words have in the Arabic language. And this is something particularly that we'll see over here, bi'idhin lahi ta'ala. So this hadith is a tremendous lesson as to how deep the Arabic language actually is. So now let's look at the narrator. Uh, not too much is known about him. His name was Sufyan bin Abdullah al Thaqafi. He came from Ta'if and he accepted Islam when the delegation of Banu Thaqif came. From the virtues of him was that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu selected him to go and collect zakat from the people of Ta'if. Selected him to collect zakat from the people of Ta'if. And altogether, there are approximately only five hadith narrated from him. Approximately only five hadith narrated from him. So now he starts off by saying, O Messenger of Allah, tell me a statement about Islam such that I will not have to ask anyone other than you. In this part of the hadith, we see something that is lost in our times, and that is the asking of advice, right? This concept of asking advice, particularly from scholars, particularly from our elders, particularly from the senior members of our community, is something that has been abandoned. You know, a lot of the times we feel ourselves to be self-sufficient, not in need of advice, not in need of further experience. But Sufyan over here is teaching us a very important point, that people who are older than us, people who are more knowledgeable than us, 
they from their rights is that we should be asking them for advice and be asking them from, for direction. And a lot of the times when we start up community projects, when we start up initiatives in the community, we have the zeal of the youth, but we don't have the wisdom of the old. And then the youth, they start making mistakes, and we wonder, you know, what went wrong? We have the zeal, they're trying to follow the sunnah, what's going wrong? What went wrong is that they didn't seek the advice of their elders. They didn't seek to involve the elders in this project. And then that is what went wrong. Because they have the wisdom, they have the experience that the youth don't have. So that is the first point we seek from this hadith. Number two is that you see uh, Sufyan trying to seek sufficiency. Like he wants to get the utmost, best and complete answer. So he clearly tells the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that look, I'm going to ask you something and I want you to be so clear and so succinct that I will not have to ask anyone after you. Right? You're going to be the beginning and the end of this issue over here. So this teaches us an etiquette in asking questions. That when you ask a question, make sure it's short to the point, and let the, question, the questioned person know what you're trying to get at. Now what are you seeking from this question? You know, a lot of the times people will ask questions, and sometimes you really wonder, you know, what is this person trying to get at? I remember um, a couple of days ago, actually this may be last week, you know, um, a person came into my office and says, Salaamu Alaikum, I'm like, Wa Alaikum Salaam. He's like, do you have any time? I'm like, sure, no problem, inshallah. So he's like, what were you doing? What did you do? To, uh, what do you have plans for later on? Uh, I'm like, you know, I'll just be in the masjid for a while and then I'm probably going to go home. And are you going to be coming back? And at this point, I'm getting annoyed, like, just tell me what you want. You know, if you want an appointment, tell me you want an appointment. If you want to sit down now, come and sit down now. And at the end, you know, it turns out that he wanted to do, get a nikah done this week, like a week later. And I was like, what was the point of all of this question of, you know, what are my plans are, how am I, well, how am I doing is a common question, but what are you doing later? Like you're not getting to the point. And this can be very frustrating as well as misguiding. So when you want an answer, be straight to the point. This is what Allah commands us with. وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا sadida. You know, speak a short and succinct speech, particularly when asking questions. And this is what Sufyan bin Abdullah was doing. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Qul amantu billah." Say, "I believe in Allah." Now, this statement of "I believe in Allah." What's important to understand over here is that this concept of belief between old and new is a huge difference. Like you'll ask someone in this day and age, do you believe in God? And yes, so, so people will say yes, but you'll find the same person that's drinking, that you know, is doing a whole bunch of other bad things, and they still you know, say that they believe in God. Of old, it was completely different. In the early stages of Islam, when they were asked, do you believe in Allah? They would say yes. And part of their belief in God was taking the action to prove that and to manifest that, right? So this statement, say I believe in Allah, is not just simple mere lip service. Do you have belief in your heart that you believe in a God? That's not the question that's being asked or answered over here. What is being answered over here is a whole way of life. Is that say I have developed a whole way of life through which I believe in God. And that is why when we talk about belief, when we talk about Iman in Islam, it's more than just simple belief in the heart and you know, service of the lips. But rather it includes, it includes the actions of the limbs as well. And that is what distinguishes the characteristics. Likewise, if you were to ask the Quraysh, do you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Their answer would be yes. But what was their problem? Is that while they did believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they are doing good deeds for His sake, they're also introducing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the usage of their idols, using them as intercessors with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So when we talk about belief, we're talking about the belief that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa came with and what the companions radiallahu anhum came with. And then he says, and then stand firm and steadfast to that. So how does one stand firm and steadfast to that in their iman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The scholars that interpreted this hadith, they mentioned two things over here. Interpretation number one, they said that this hadith is actually divided into two main concepts. Concept number one is the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And concept number two is following up that belief with actions. The first part of the hadith is iman, which is stems from the heart, which is the proper belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a the second part of it, which is the correct actions that needs to be done with this. The second interpretation over here is that no, it is not a separation of belief and actions, 
but rather the first part of the hadith is belief and actions, which is iman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the second part is the struggle to stay on the straight, to stay as the straight path. The second part is the struggle to stay on the straight path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I believe this difference in interpretation, it went back to some of the scholars having that difference of opinion. Are actions actually a part of faith or not? Those, act, those scholars that said actions were a part of faith, then they went to the second opinion. And those scholars that said that, you know, actions are just a condition for the perfection of faith, then they went towards opinion number one. And for our sake and discussion, when we talk about this hadith, we will be going with opinion number two, which is the first part of the hadith, means to have the proper belief and the proper actions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the second part of the hadith is the continuation of the struggle. That, you know, you're all not always going to be at a high level in your iman. You're not always going to be at the same level in your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second part is the struggle that comes with this. So now, one of the questions that should come to your mind, if you're critically analyzing this hadith, is that a Muslim comes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and he tells him, say, I believe in Allah. Why would the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell this individual, say I believe in Allah, when this person is already a Muslim? I need someone to answer that question for me. Go ahead. Saying, uh, saying it cleanses the heart. Saying it cleanses the heart. More than that. More than that. Does it just sort of solidify the fact that even though you're a Muslim, you should possibly um, be doing the shahada and, and reminding yourself? Fantastic. So it is a renewal of faith. So that is opinion number one as to why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling this individual, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ Say, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the adhkar of the morning and the evening, he teaches us to say, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبًّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَبِمُحَمِّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نَبِيًّا وَرَسُولًا Right, he teaches us to say that I'm pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as my Lord, Islam as my way of life, and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم as a prophet and messenger. While the Muslim already believes this, each day when he says this, and in fact twice, twice in the day, in the morning and in the evening, when he says this, this is a renewal of his faith. It is a reminder to him that look, this is what I'm living for, this is what I'm striving for, and this is what I need to go forth with. The second interpretation of as to why the Messenger of Allah wasallam mentions this, and this is like a bit of a far-fetched explanation, is that in the first part of the hadith, the Messenger of Allah wasallam is just giving general advice. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows that these narrations will be carried on to the next generation and eventually be preserved and go on till the end of time. So the Messenger of Allah takes this opportunity to give a simple message to all of mankind. That all of mankind should have the proper belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the first part of the hadith, he gives an advice which is very very general, which applies to him and as well to other than him. But then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gives him the part which is exclusive and specific to him, which is to seek istiqama. Which is to seek istiqama. So now that leads us to our discussion and just, you know, the point to further explain what we just discussed. There's actually a verse in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhu alladhina amanu, aminu billahi wa rasulihi wal kitab alladhi nazzala ala rasulihi. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, believe in Allah and His Messenger and the book which has been sent down to His Messenger. So the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers to believe in Allah again was to renew their faith, was to renew their faith. So now we move on to the actual meaning of istiqama, the actual meaning of istiqama. What does the term istiqama actually mean? The term istiqama, it comes from the word qiyam, right? The word qiyam. In modern day Arabic, we understand the term qiyam to mean just a standing up straight. Right? That's how we understand qiyam. So when you say qiyam layl it means that you are standing up during the night. But the term qiyam actually has a greater significance. And that is one of consistency. So when you're qa'imun ala shay, you're constantly you know, on that thing. right? Constantly monitoring that thing. right? Another aspect of qiyam is that when you talk about qiyam, it's about be something being straight without any curves in it. So when we talk about sirat al-mustaqim, it is the path that has no, 
you know, divergence in it, it has no swerves in it, it is the, the straight path. So that is where the term istiqama is actually coming from. That is the linguistic meaning for it. Now the technical meaning or the shara'i meaning for it, this is where the scholars have had, you know, a, a wide variety of opinions on this. Some of the early predecessors said that istiqama is to make the religion only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was mentioned by Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, this was mentioned by the Tabi'i Abu Alia, this was also mentioned by the student of Ibn Abbas, Qatada. Qatada added that it is not only to make the deen for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is also to remain continual in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For our sake of discussion, we're actually going to divert from these early definitions. Because as you'll come to see later on, the term istiqama is much much more than just making the deen purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is purely more than just you know, staying obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the istiqama that we're talking about is two things over here. Number one, it is the cognitive decision to try to abstain from sin as much as possible. It is a cognitive decision to abstain from sin as much as possible. And then the second element to this is that since we will fall into sin, it is guaranteed that we will fall into sin, it is the immediate turning in tawbah after that sin is committed. It is the immediate turning in tawbah after it is committed. So now you look at the two parts of our definition. Part number one is that we are going to make this cognitive decision that I'm going to try never ever to sin again in my life, right? That is the goal. We have an exam in life, we're trying to get that 100%. Now the reality of the situation is that we're not going to reach that 100%, right? Not every exam will you be able to get that 100%. And that is, this is one exam that you can't get 100% in. And after you realize that yes, I will be prone to mistakes, I will be prone to make sin, I'm making a decision that immediately after I sin, I will make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now you sort of get a reflection as to one, why this term istiqamah is such a profound word in the Arabic language. And number two, you start to realize how difficult it is to live up to this. You know, coming to that decision in your life where you think about intentionally that I'm never going to sin again. When was the last time we did something like that? That you're going to sit down, you make the intention, I'm never ever going to sin again. And if I do fall into a sin, I'm going to make sure I hasten in performing tawbah. And this is something that needs to be done each and every single day, right? So it becomes very, very heavy. It becomes very, very heavy. Now let us take a look at istiqamah in the Qur'an. And the first verse we want to look at is in Surah Al-Hud, verse 112. And I believe this is very important to note down for those of you that are taking notes. Put Surah Al-Hud, verse 112. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in this ayah, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكْ وَلَا تَضْغَوْ إِنَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ Therefore stand firm on the straight path as you're commanded, and those who turn in repentance with you, and do not transgress the straight path, for he sees well all that you do. Now why is this verse so significant? This verse is significant for several reasons. Number one, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he was asked, what was the most difficult verse in the Qur'an upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And he said it was this verse right over here. He says this was the most difficult verse upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the Quran. Number two is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in his young age, he started to get white hair. And he was asked, you know, what is it that is causing you to get this white hair? Who remembers the answer? What did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say? And what else? Hud and? Her sisters, fantastic. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, "Shayibatni hudun wa akhawatuha." That Hud and you know her sisters, they are the ones that have caused me to get white hair. And they commented that there was this one particular verse from Surah Hud that was so heavy upon him. But in uh, a more general sense, if you look at Surah Hud and, and Surah Waqia and these other surahs that came down at that time. They're very heavy in terms of the threats. Very, very heavy in terms of the threats of what's going to happen to the people on the Day of Judgment and in the hereafter. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam having to convey this to the people was very, very burdensome upon him. 
The third thing we look at is that this verse actually gives us a better glimpse as to what istiqama is, right? So here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is commanded, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتَ That become upright, become righteous, just like you were commanded, and as well as those with you, though, as well as those that have repented with you, as well as those that have repented with you. So this command is not only for the Messenger of Allah, but it is for the companions as well, that are constant in their repentance. And this is where we get the second part of our definition from, that the first part of istiqama is the decision to not do any sin, and then the second part of istiqama is that if when a sin is committed, you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where we're getting it from. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is told, and do not transgress, for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that you do, and He sees everything that you do. So now, this part of the verse is, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions are told, that do not go to extremes, do not cross the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going to come to a discussion to this, but shaitan's tactics in, the, in getting the people to lose their istiqamah are two tactics. Number one is that if their natural personality is one of being easygoing and very lax, then shaitan will tackle them from the door of laziness. And if their, national, if their natural personality is to be very energetic, very enthusiastic, very zealous, then shaitan enters upon them through that door, and then he takes them through towards the door of extremism, of becoming extreme in their faith and in their religion. So here we notice a, I guess a dichotomy is set that istiqamah is what one should hope for, and then falling short in istiqamah means that you're transgressing the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of two ways. Either becoming overzealous, or to becoming lackadaisical in the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice that in many other verses in the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses istiqama, istiqama is placed in comparison to transgressing the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, let's, let's look at the addition of the hadith that was not mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Who can remind me what is the addition in the hadith that is not found in Sahih Muslim? What is the addition in the hadith? To watch his tongue. To watch his tongue. But what are the exact wordings? Do you remember brief, yeah, briefly? Said, what, what is it specifically that you fear for me? Yes. Fantastic. So he asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, what is it that you fear the most for me? And then he took his own tongue and he said this, I fear for you the tongue. I fear for you the tongue. Now why was the tongue actually mentioned? Why was the tongue actually mentioned? There's an explicit hadith found in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا يستقيم إيمان عبد حتى يستقيم قلبه ولا يستقيم قلبه حتى يستقيم, حتى يستقيم لسانه The faith of a person will not be straight and sound until his heart is made straight and sound. And his heart will not be straight and sound until his tongue is made straight and sound. So over here you see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is telling us explicitly and directly what is needed in order for a person to gain that istiqamah. It is the protection and preservation of two important organs in Islam. They are the tongue and they are the heart. They are the tongue and the heart. And here particularly the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that the heart needs to be rectified, but what rectifies the heart is the tongue. So it is the sins that we commit to, through our, our tongues that they actually corrupt our hearts. So a lot of the times when a person feels distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he feels his iman low. One of the things he should be looking at is, you know, what are the things that he's saying with his tongue. And that is why you see the predecessors, they were so strict upon themselves in controlling their tongues. That they would try their utmost best to speak good or remain silent. And if there was ever a doubt, then they would choose to remain silent. They would choose to remain silent. That is the course that they took. So here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that this road to istiqamah is going to be through two main milestones. One is the rectification of the tongue, and two is the rectification of the heart. In terms of the rectification of the tongue, there are several sins that one has to abstain from with the tongue. The most obvious of them is disbelief, then speaking without knowledge, then uh, slander, then backbiting, and then lying. 
You know, these are the five things that the scholars mention, that these are from the major sins of the tongue. These are from the major sins of the tongue. They are disbelief, to speak without knowledge, slander, backbiting, and lying. Slander has uh, a higher level than backbiting. Who can tell me why? Why does slander have a higher level than backbiting? I asked you already, so I'll go over here this time. Because slander is not true, and backbiting is Fantastic. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked his companions, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا الْغِيبَ He says, ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا يَقْرَحْ That, do you know what ghiba is? They said, no, O Messenger of Allah. He said, it is the mentioning of your brother, that which he dislikes. So the companions followed up with this. They said, O Messenger of Allah, what if we actually see this characteristic in him? Then he said, this is ghiba. And if you don't find that characteristic in him, then this is slander. Then this is slander. And the worst type of slander that can take place is what? Who can tell me what the worst type of slander is? Sorry? Who's? Slandering someone with adultery? Yes, it is the, the accusation of a chaste woman of having committed fornication. It is the accusation of a chaste woman to have committed fornication. This is the worst type of slander that can take place. In fact, in the Islamic court of law, this is the only type of slander where lashes would actually be given by the court of law. A person would receive lashes. Because a person's honor is, 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 has such a, a high level in Islam, that when you accuse someone of having you know, lost their virginity in, in the incorrect manner, then this is something that would deserve lashes if the evidences are not brought forth, and if it is proven to be false. If it is proven to be false. Fantastic, yes. So it is to speak of disbelief. Number two, to speak without knowledge. Number three, it is to slander. Number four is to backbite. And number five is to lie. Number five is to lie. And these are the five major sins that are committed by the tongue. These are the five major sins that are committed by the tongue. Some of the scholars also included a sixth one, which is namima, which is to incite fighting between people. So you want to cause chaos in a community, you get two people to fight with one another, and get people to take sides, and then you've destroyed a community. And we've seen this happen in every single community, subhanAllah. And that is, you know, from the tricks of shaitan. And that is why they even included namima as the sixth one, which is to incite fighting with the people. Now when it comes to the heart, even the heart has many, many sins. But we're going to take a few of them. Number one, to love um, someone or something more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To love someone or something more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about love over here, this concept of love will include fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fearing someone more than we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will also include hoping, having hope in someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love will encompass all of that. Number two is having jealousy and having envy. So not being content with the qadr of Allah, that in essence is what jealousy and envy is. That you're saying, Allah should have given this to me and not given it to that other individual. So envy is from them. Number three, is have hatred towards people. Hatred towards people. That people haven't done anything wrong, or if they've done a little amount of wrong, you have this enormous amount of hate, and not wanting to forgive people. And not wanting to forgive people. From the sins of the heart, is that the heart does not turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart just naturally, it's gone to a state where it's so dead, that it no longer wants to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you attended our, our previous dust when we were talking about modesty and shyness, we said that this is the effect of losing modesty and shyness. That a person loses so much modesty and shyness, that his heart eventually dies, and that it no longer seeks to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are some of the, of the sins of the heart that a person needs to be aware of. That a person needs to be aware of. Now, let us get into the discussion of this challenge of istiqama. So we said, istiqama is this decision to leave off sins altogether, and then if when one does perform sin, it is to raise to tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this challenge is seen in various hadith by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to share some of those hadith with you. So the first hadith is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّكُمْ لَن تُطِيقُوا أَوْ لَن تَفْعَلُوا كُلَّ مَا أُمِرْتُمْ بِهِ وَلَكِنْ سَدِّدُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا He says, O people, you are not able to and you will not do all that you are ordered to do. But instead, try to be upright 
and have glad tidings. So here the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is reaffirming that fact that none of us will be able to fulfill all of the commandments that were given, but rather we are going to fall short. But the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he tells us, keep trying, keep struggling in this path to be upright and have glad tidings. Why is the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying have glad tidings? What is the significance of having glad tidings? He's just told us that look, you're not going to be able to do what you do, or what you're commanded with, so why are we meant to have glad tidings? Go ahead. Because if you turn back to Allah, maybe the ultimate reward is Jannah. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But there's something even bigger and greater than this. Go ahead. You have the balance of fear and uh, hope in Allah. If you have too much fear, then you're not, not going to be able to complete it, and you're not going to get Jannah. Fantastic. So that is good. So now let us dwell on the point that you're making over here. Where does the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lie? Where is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is where the answer is. Go ahead. You seeking forgiveness? That's part of it, but we need something more general than that. So that's like istighfar and tawbah. I need something more general than that. Our brother in the back? And so that's the first part of the hadith. But why should you get glad tidings for this? Who has the phone? Turn off the phone. <laughs> no, it's yours. <laughs> no worries, inshallah. You're so engaged in the dars. <laughs> that's good. I like that, inshallah. Taib. So now back to the answer. I need one more person to try this out. Where is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I don't know. Same as what you said with repentance. Okay, but that's too specific. I need it more general. So we're... The remembrance of Allah. No, I'll give you a shot since you haven't spoken yet. It's like before you're saying that you're struggling in this path, the struggle that you're going through to keep going back and forth. I'll accept that. Good, alhamdulillah. So the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in you getting the good deed done. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in you getting the good deed done. It is in the attempt for you trying to get it done, right? That is where the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lies. And this is why that hadith of إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ is such a significant hadith, that actions are based upon the intentions, that once you've made that sincere intention, you've attained the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that pleasure of Allah only increases once the deed is actually done. Similarly over here, is that make the intention that look, you're going to try to abstain from sin. And even if you fall short, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already rewarded you for your intention to struggle, for your intention to struggle in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is where the glad tidings come into play. And the second hadith, and it's a very similar hadith to this, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Saddidu wa qaribu. Saddidu wa qaribu. That be straight on the path or be close to it. Be close to it. And this is in terms of a Muslim having a target in mind in terms of where he's trying to go in his faith. Where he's trying to go in his faith. So the Messenger of Allah is reminding us that look, keep aiming towards where you're going. And even if you don't hit the target, then try to come as close as possible. Try to come as close as possible to that target. Another reminder that you're not always going to hit the target. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't aim, but rather aim to get as close as possible. You aim to get as close as possible. Possible. And the third hadith is the most significant one. So if you zoned out, I'm asking you to zone back in, particularly for this hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he tells us in a, a very you know, profound and a hadith that needs a, a lot of you know, critical analysis. He tells us, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ عَمَلٍ شِرَّةً وَلِكُلِّ شِرَّةٍ فَتْرَةً فَإِمَّا إِلَى سُنَّةٍ وَإِمَّا إِلَى بِدْعَةٍ فَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَتُهُ إِلَى سُنَّةٍ فَقَدْ إِحْتَدَى وَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَتُهُ إِلَى غَيْرِ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ هَلَكَ That every deed has its period of high emotion and zealousness, and every such feeling has its time of cooling down. The latter time is either towards the sunnah or towards innovation. If this person's time of this nature is towards the sunnah, he is rightly guided. And this time, uh, and if his time of nature is towards other than that, he is destroyed. He is destroyed. What does this hadith mean and why is it so profound? The Messenger of Allah wasallam, he's telling us the cycle of iman. He's telling us that in your iman, you will have levels of your iman that are extremely high. Where in those high levels of iman, you feel like you can take on the world, you can achieve anything that you want to achieve in your faith at that time. 
And he also tells us that just like you were at that high, that iman will come down. And the significant part is not the high of your iman, but the significant part is what is the low of your iman look like? What does it actually look like? What happens when your iman actually goes down? So here the Messenger of Allah is saying that whoever's iman, when it sinks, it goes towards the sunnah, then he is saved. When it goes towards the sunnah, then he is saved. But if it goes towards other than that, that is when the person is destroyed. That is when the person is destroyed. To put this hadith in context, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ says that the most beloved of deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the most consistent of them. They are the most consistent of them. So here we learn very, very valuable lessons. Lesson number one is that one should pay attention to the cycle of their iman. Pay attention to the cycle of your iman. That your iman will go up, your iman will go down. When your iman is up, rather than doing a lot of big deeds, Focus on introducing small consistent deeds in your life. Focus on introducing small consistent deeds in your life. Number two, when your iman does go down, realize that you have a decision over here, that your iman going down can actually stay upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah wasallam, which is like the deen of Islam altogether, or it can go towards other than that. And when you notice towards going other than that, then notice at that time that a person is destroyed. How do we put this in a practical scenario of what we're talking about? So when a person's iman is high, hopefully one of the things that they're striving to do is that they're praying their sunnah and nafal prayers. That's what we're hoping for, right? So we'll talk about three stages over here. A person who has high iman, he's praying his fard, sunnah, and nafal prayers. Fantastic. So this is what high iman looks like. His iman starts to dip a little, he drops his nafal prayers. Okay, so now he's praying his fard and his sunnah. His iman, when it completely plummets, he still has his fard prayers. He still has his fard prayers, and that's what he's holding on to with Islam. That's what he's holding on to with Islam. Now, let us talk about the individual whose his high iman is the fact that he's praying five times a day. This is like the high point of his iman, that he's praying five times a day. When his iman crashes, what's going to happen to him? He's going to lose his salah, right? He's lost his fard prayers. One, two, three, four, maybe even all five of them. That's what happens when his iman crashes. So the Messenger of Allah wasallam is teaching us that protect your iman by introducing these regular deeds. Your iman will not be protected by big, grandiose de- de- deeds. What will protect your iman is those small, consistent deeds. And that is what the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was. And that's what's important to understand, that we all go through, the, through these iman highs, rather than achieving for big things at that time, aim for consistent things. Because that is what is going to protect your iman. So a person with his fard and his sunnah prayers, he stays consistent, is much better than the individual when his iman is high, he's praying tahajjud and qiyamul layl, but when his iman dips, he's not praying at all, right? So focus on consistency rather than grandiose deeds. And this is a very, very important hadith that, you know, I, I believe that had we been taught and, you know, explained when a lot of us were young, it would have saved us from a lot of strife in the struggles of our faith. Because no one told us that, you know, don't aim for those big deeds that are one off, but aim for consistency, right? It was always about doing the bigger and, and better deed as a young child when you're zealous and filled with youth. But then you'll notice that people quickly burn out after that. How many Muslims do we know that burned out because they didn't focus on consistency, but they focused on doing the grand dose deed itself. Now as the time for Maghrib gets closer, I want to discuss two last things with you guys, Bidhanillahi Ta'ala. Number one is the requirements for istiqamah. The requirements for istiqamah. So according to Ibn al-Qayyim, in order to have istiqamah, six deeds need to be met. And we're going to discuss these very briefly, inshallah, and then move on to the last point. So Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, in order for a person to attain istiqamah, number one, he needs to perform the required deeds. Number one, he needs to perform the required deeds. Number two, he needs to struggle in performing those deeds. He needs to struggle in performing those deeds. So now just to give a brief commentary on this point, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying that the, the, the required deeds, if you're no longer struggling to perform them, 
then you need to take your faith to the next level, which is doing like the sunnah and nafil prayers, meaning that there always needs to be an element of struggle in your faith. That if there's no element of struggle, then you're doing something wrong and you need to move on to the next level. So level number, point number two, was that you need to struggle in performing those deeds. Number three, restricting oneself to what is lawful while performing those deeds. Restricting oneself to what is lawful while performing those deeds. What does that mean exactly? What that entails is, a person should be earning halal, he should be eating halal, he should be dressing halal, he should be speaking halal, Everything in his life, he should try to make it as halal as possible. Right? Restrict your oneself to what is lawful. Number four, is that everything that he does should be based upon knowledge. Everything that he does should be based upon knowledge. That even if you were to lift your hand a certain way, you should have a proof as to why you're doing it that way. So everything you do should be founded upon knowledge. Number five, is singling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out in each and every intention. Singling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out in each and every intention. And this is perhaps like the most difficult part. That when you're starving, you're like almost, you feel as if you're like dying of hunger. At that time, the intention isn't to eat for the sake of Allah, it's the intention to, to, to feed the body. And everything with every other desire, you're like dead tired, the intention won't be like, let me sleep, get some rest, so that I can wake up for Fajr, wake up for Qiyam layl but it's going to be just for the sake of getting rest. So each and every intention, you make it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the sixth and last point that he mentions, is that each and every single deed that you perform, you try to perform it according to the way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it. You try to perform each and every single deed the way the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it. From going to the bathroom, from sleeping, to marital relations, to everything. Everything you try to do according to the way the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he's very strict in this, subhanAllah. He actually goes on to say, and if you fall short in even one of them, then you have lost istiqamah. If you fall short in even one of them, you have lost istiqamah. And now you start to see why this concept of istiqamah is so difficult. You start to see why this concept of istiqamah is so difficult. Now, let us conclude with what are the means towards gaining istiqamah? You know, what is the journey that one takes towards getting towards istiqamah? And Ibn, Qay- Ibn Al-Qayyim and Ibn Rajab both comment on this and there are eight points in this. Number one, turning to the Qur'an each and every day. Turning to the Qur'an each and every day. Meaning you have a regular reading of the Qur'an that is never abandoned. You have a regular reading of the Qur'an that is never abandoned. Number two, is continually checking yourself. Constantly, you know, monitoring your progress. Number three, striving hard to improve yourself. So never being content with where you are in your faith, but striving hard to get even better. Number four, Sincerely supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's beautiful commentary on this that we discussed in Surah Al-Fatiha that the only dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to say 17 times each and every single day at the very least is ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. That, O oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Now you understand why it's such a significant dua to make. That you're asking Allah, O oh Allah, help me in my utmost best to abstain from committing sin. And if I do sin, then guide me to perform tawbah right away. Right? That is what the straight path actually is. Number five is acquiring sound Islamic knowledge. Acquiring sound Islamic knowledge. And Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he was also very strict in this aspect. He said that knowledge is not just about reading from the books. But knowledge is actually studying with a shaykh, benefiting from his manners, and then benefiting from his knowledge. Right? Those are you know, what he means by gaining sound Islamic knowledge. It's not just sitting in front of a computer listening to YouTube and you know, just doing that. But rather, try to find a shaykh, benefit from his manners, and then benefit from his knowledge. Number six, studying and following the examples of the prophets and the, uh, the righteous people of the past. Studying and following the examples of the, the prophets and the righteous people of the past. Number seven, sticking to the Islamic community. Sticking to the Islamic community. Meaning that you're trying your utmost best to find the uh, righteous people wherever they are. If they're in the masjid, you're going to the masjid. If they're in the durus and halakat, you're going to the durus and halakat. You're trying to surround yourself with the righteous people as much as possible. And number eight, 
is having a daily remembrance of the hereafter. Having a daily remembrance of the hereafter. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, when he comments on this, this is actually a, a beautiful reflection. When he says, uh, reflecting on the hereafter, it's not just about remembering the hellfire. But he says, each day focus on something different. One day think about death. The other day think about Jannah. The other day think about the punishment of the grave. The other day think about the hellfire. The other day think about standing in front of Allah and being questioned. The other day think about your deeds being weighed on the scales. Right? So think about, have a daily reflection of the hereafter. And this will, you know, help in uh, guiding a person straight. Guiding a person straight. Now the last thing I want to, to leave you guys with is a beautiful verse in the Qur'an in uh, Surah Fussilat. Let me just get that out, insha'Allah. Um, that's the Ahqaf one. Yes, here is Surah Fussilat. So this is in Surah Fussilat, verses 30 to 32. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in these beautiful verses, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِّنْ غَفُورٍ رَحِيمٍ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in these beautiful verses, Verily those people who say, Our Lord is Allah, and stand firm and steadfast. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا So exactly what this hadith is telling us. You accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your Lord, and then you seek istiqamah. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to tell us what the virtues of this are. Upon them angels will descend at their time of death, saying, Fear not and grieve not, but receive the glad tidings of paradise. So at the time of death, they will receive a glad tiding and they will be told not to, be, not to fear, but you have been promised. We have been your friends and protectors in this life, and so we shall be in the hereafter. That the angels will look after you in this life, as well as in the hereafter. Therein you shall have everything that your soul desires, and therein you shall have all that you ask. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for these people that said Allah is our Lord and then sought istiqamah, everything that they desire in the hereafter, a hospitable gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the most forgiving and the most merciful. And what's beautiful over here is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes with um, that this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most forgiving and the most merciful, uh, ghafoor rahim This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Along this journey of istiqamah, he's going to forgive, right? Because if he wasn't going to forgive, then this would be an impossible journey. And the fact that he is Rahim is an indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to facilitate this journey for those who try to seek it. That yes, you will face challenges, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy, and this is part of his mercy. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I'll conclude with this, the significance of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that none of us will enter Jannah through our deeds. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, not even you. And he said, not even I. إِلَّا أَن يَتَغَمَّدَنِي اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِي Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to drown me in His mercy. So now you, need, you see the, the relevance of this, that even the deeds that we do, they eventually become insignificant in the greater realm of things. That we do them to attain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for it is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that enters us into paradise. And it is not the deeds within of themselves. But what the deeds do do, is that they determine our rank in paradise. So while they are not the reason of us entering paradise, they determine the rank of where we will be in paradise. So for those of us that want a higher rank, then we strive even harder. Those of us that will be content with just entering into paradise, then we strive with the utmost minimum. SubhanAllah, you know in preparing for this halaqah, it was a, a, a big journey because it reminded me of the, of the journey that I went through. And I sort of went over time and I wanted to share a couple of stories with you. But um, one story that, that I will share with you and perhaps inshallah there's a benefit and lesson in this for all of us was that I remember I was uh, 14 years old at the time. And there's like this famous, famous singer uh, Nusrat Fatali. I don't know if he, the Pakistanis have heard of this guy, but he was like, you know, the most famous Pakistani singer of that time. And he was invited to our house in Montreal. He was, he had some sort of concert. And, you know, my parents, uh, at that time, they're like, you know what? Uh, we know the organizers. Let's invite him over, over to our house. 
And at that time, I, t- I took a, a very, very strict you know, stance on this. I told my mom, you know, you choose. Either he comes to the house, or you know, I, I leave the house. There, there, there's no way we're both going to be in the house at the same time. And subhanAllah, my mom chose him. <laughs> She's like, you know what, it's too late. You know, he's already invited, we can't reject the invitation. But I said, really, if that's the case? And she thought, a 14-year-old kid, you know, what type of protest is he going to do? Uh, I told her, I'm not going to, to come back to the house uh, until he's gone. I'm going, to, I'm going to just stay in the masjid. And my mom's like, whatever, you know, you're just a, a young, foolish kid. So... Uh, um, uh, that night I, I ran away to the masjid. I, I told her in advance where I was running away to. I ran away to the masjid. You know, at Asr time I went to the masjid and I stayed there all the way till after Fajr. And that turned out to be like a, a big turning point in the, in the life of my parents at that time because they're like, wow, this kid is you know, actually serious. That we should take him seriously in terms of what he's saying. And I remember that Yes, there was that initial pain that, you know, why would my mother choose someone who's not her son over me? And that hurt a lot. You know, that was very, very painful for me at the time. But what turned out to be the blessing in disguise was it was that protest and going through that pain that eventually became one of the catalysts in my, per- in my parents becoming guided. You know, after that, they, you know, we sat down, we discussed the evils and harms of music, the evils and harms of having, you know, such people in your house, the importance of salah, and then we started having these very, very deep discussions. And this is, you know, I guess part of the discussion we're having tonight is that yes, you know, I look back and I think, you know, maybe it was foolish to run away from the house and, and, and stay in the masjid that night. But at the same time, I think that perhaps it's possible that if I didn't do that, then, you know, it, 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 it is possible that maybe my parents wouldn't have changed. So I think there needs to be that balance between you know, having ghira for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as being zealous at the same time. And at the same time, having wisdom in everything that you do as well. So all of us, we're all going to go through our own journeys. No two of us are at the exact same place right now, and no two of us are going to end up in the exact same place. But what's important to understand, my dear brothers and sisters, and this is the point I was trying to get home, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not looking at the deeds that you are performing, He is looking at your attempt at performing those deeds. So aim high in performing those deeds, and aim for consistency. Because that is what will attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us in this life and the next. May Allah forgive us for our shortcomings, and may He grant us istiqamah. Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.